Good morning, everybody. This is Ben Briscoe again, First Baptist Church, Pierce Hall, coming to you on volume two of our videoed uh, Sunday school lesson. Um, excited for an opportunity to come back and, and uh, speak to you this way, although I will confess I miss the class and miss seeing everybody and look forward to getting back to normal again and doing that. Um, so th this is pre-recorded. obviously it's a Friday afternoon and I'm going to act like it's Sunday morning. Um, so um, good morning to you guys and uh, we'll get ready for some action-packed study of the book of Luke still in Luke chapter 2, uh, carrying on from last week. Uh, so um, as we always do here, we're going to open in prayer, and our typical protocol is to take prayer request. and since there's no one to take prayer requests uh, from, we'll pray for the normal things that we always do, which is our church, our city, our state, our country. I'll talk about that in just a little bit. I do have a couple of personal prayer requests. We're going to pray for a guy named Vince who has cancer and another guy named Gary who has diabetes. We want to do that um, and um, in, our, in our actual prayer request in addition to the normal stuff. But this has been a trying week. I know uh, uh, the country's going through some uh, hard times. Uh, this quarantine, this uh, uh, virus has really created quite a stir and because we look back, uh, in a lot of ways, 911 changed this country, and to some degree, you wonder what kind of changes this uh, coronavirus is going to uh, do for us. But uh, the desire, hopefully, it's going to make us stronger and better. Um, we need to always remember to keep our president in his prayers. Hear a lot of Monday morning quarterback in on the, the things that he's doing, but uh, I can only imagine what it would be like to be in his shoes and try to lead this battle against this unseen enemy that is striking so hard. But we want to remember to lift him up and his staff. Seemed like he surrounded himself with some really great people that have uh, the best of this nation in mind. So um, that is something that we can definitely do to help make a difference, uh, even though we're on the periphery of this. And hopefully we stay on the periphery of this virus but with the um, and and two as we spoke a little bit last week um, heard the president's request that we give it 15 days and from Sunday morning when you guys are viewing this that'll be one more day that'll be day 14 so the following day Monday will be 15 days we get a chance to re-evaluate where we are with this virus so hopefully um, we see the numbers starting to peak um, and, and flatten out, and already I can report I've heard that uh, New York, um, it's doubling, but the rate that it's doubling is slowing down uh, even as much as 50%, so that's certainly a good sign. And we may not be able to go back to work Monday or Tuesday, but hopefully, prayerfully, it'll be soon. And, and two, this is something that we as Christians can pray for, as, as uh, the president said, it would be great. Wouldn't it be great if we could go back to work in, on Easter? And oh my gosh, what a day that is for us, and what a day that would be for our country. And the, the uh, analogies there between us, Christ raising, and our economy getting back to uh, work would be a tremendous thing. So um, that is something that I would very much like for us all to be praying for: is getting this country back to work because that is what we do best. And time is what the president has asked for. And if we need another, another week or two, uh, we can do that. Understandably so. Looks like the stimulus package has been, been approved. And so some much needed help will go out to some of these folks that are struggling. Um, but again, I know that comes with a price tag as a nation with a $22 trillion debt. Another $2 trillion is an awful lot of money. A lot of things to think through and work through here. But but anyway, a, a, a lot more reasons, folks, for us to continue to pray. A lot of tough decisions are being made, and um, we have a role in that as uh, believers and as Christians uh, to, to lift up our president and to, uh, to pray for, for sound judgment and sound decisions in taking us forward. And we all want to do our part as well in getting back to work and getting this economy back to Jenin. So if you would join me uh, in prayer. We'll, uh, we'll uh, 
worship and praise the Father. Dear God in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to gather in your house. And we praise you and we worship you. And we are grateful for all that we have. And we acknowledge you and your glory sitting on your throne. And uh, we thank you for redemption and salvation. And Father, the grace that we get through faith in you. And Father, thank you that we're justified in that. And Lord God, thank you that we get to walk in your righteousness. And Father, guide us in that. Lord, I want to pray for this man, Vince, who has cancer, and I want to pray for his, his health, Father, if it be your will, and I want to pray for uh, his family and the doctors that deal with him. And Lord, uh, this man, Gary, that has diabetes, I want to pray for him and his family. And Father God, I want to lift up all the, all the doctors and the health care workers and the policemen and the EMS, Father, those, those that are just working so hard and so diligently across this country. To, uh, to defeat this virus and to, to heal those that are sick, sometimes at their own peril, Father, that they're working hard and um, exposed to this virus themselves. We just we pray for them and their safety. And Father God, we lift up our president to you. We lift up Donald Trump, and we pray for Mike Pence, and we pray for these doctors and um, health care specialists that he has surrounded himself with, and we pray for wisdom and knowledge and discernment. And we just pray your hand will be upon them. As they, uh, as they study this, uh, this, this virus and, and map out a plan for this country and how we act and how we respond. And Lord God, we want to pray for this special day, this Easter day, which is a target to get this nation back to work. If we're not able to do so beforehand, Lord, we just pray it be then, by then. And Father God, that, that our people get back to work and, uh, and get this thing behind us. And Lord, those that are working on a cure perhaps, or a vaccine, we just pray your hand will be upon that, and we just pray that, um, um, that, that you assist us in, um, in getting that done. Father God, we pray for, uh, we pray for this, this church, we pray for our ministry, and uh, we pray that we're able to serve your kingdom. Lord, I pray for each one of the folks that are out there in the audience that are, that are watching today, I pray for their health and their safety, and I uh, pray for their families. I pray for their jobs, Father, and I pray for their financial situation, Lord, that um, they'll be able to get back to work soon. Lord, I pray for the Sunday school class, the members here uh, that are not present now, but I just, I'm grateful for them and I miss them. And Father God, I just, I just pray that you uh, watch over God and protect them. Lord, guide me in this uh, lesson today. Lord, let your word come out and we pray the presence of the Holy Spirit will be present and uh, be evident in your scriptures. Father God, thank you. We're grateful. We pray these things in Jesus Christ, your son's name. Amen. And so uh, I got a few comments last week about this class, and I, I have to give a big shout out to Miss Stacy. She is, uh, we have a, a, a Christian school here, and she, this is the art class, and she does a great job. If we could pan around, look at the rest of the room, it's really well decorated, but um, if you can see Dr. Seuss and all this other stuff, Mona Lisa there. Um, the room is very well decorated. So it's the art class for our, uh, our Christian school. And so that's, uh, that's, that's, that's also doubles as my Sunday school class, our Sunday school class on uh, every Sunday morning. Um, so we're putting the church building to good use during the week and on Sundays as well. Um, so anyway, Luke chapter 2. Now last week we talked about uh, Jesus uh, being circumcised, and we talked about him being dedicated, and the, the 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 you know the act of that, and the two people that that were present that made a huge impact that were recorded by Luke, that were providing some blessings for the family and some oversight about uh, Jesus and his life to Mary and Joseph. That was Simeon and Anna. We studied about them last week. Well, we're going to finish up in Luke chapter two this week, and. Um, today's lesson will be uh, 40, Luke chapter 2, verses 40 through 52. And I did, I was able to watch this as well, and I, I apologize, I say um and uh quite a bit, and I'm going to do everything I can to kind of squelch that and uh, p polish my uh, speaking skills a little bit in front of the video camera. But if, I apologize if I um and ah too much. I'm going to work on trying not to do that. Okay, so... Luke chapter 2, verse 40. Now, again, I had mentioned the 
movie that we watch sometimes at Christmas time called uh, The Nativity, and it depicts Christ being born in a cave, and at that very night the shepherds come, which Scripture's pretty clear. I think we get a pretty clear, clear picture that the shepherds do come out of the fields that particular night, but also um, the, the, the magi come from the east and give him the three gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and then that very night he has a vision where God speaks to him and, and gets him to get up and go to Egypt, and he does in the middle of the night, which Scripture says that. But you can kind of piece together that it probably didn't happen quite like that. He was circumcised in the temple. Uh, it's further reported that when the Magi came, they were in a house. So sometime after he was circumcised, day 8, um, and, and probably after the Magi came, which was when they were in uh, Jerusalem, then they fled for fear of what Herod was going to do. And you know he did a terrible, terrible thing by killing everybody in the town of Bethlehem, under the all-male children under the age of two. That was the reason that God had Joseph and Mary and, and Jesus flee to Egypt, where they stayed a number of years until Herod died. And then they came back, and they moved to uh, Galilee in the town of Nazareth, which is, um, my map is over there, you probably, probably can't see that. But anyway, it's northwestern Israel, up kind of above the Sea of Galilee. I got a map over there, which you probably can't see, and I apologize about not being able to include you in that. But anyway, picture northwest uh, Israel, where Galilee was, and uh, Nazareth is a, a city in that region. And so uh, this finds us about this time of year, uh, the Feast of the Passover. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, what they were doing is the family, which all Jewish people, make a pilgrimage annually for the kind of their big festival of the year was the Passover. And most people tried to celebrate that in Jerusalem. Nazareth from Jerusalem is about 100 miles, more or less. And supposedly, by foot, it was a five-day journey. And so you can imagine um, packing up the kids and all the gear and going on a five-day camping trip. And then the Feast of the Passover started was typically a seven-day festival and so you had five days plus seven days plus another five days on back you're talking about uh, 17 days uh, in, a, in a vacation time or a festival time to pack up the family and go to Jerusalem but it's kind of funny or you think about uh, all you moms out there getting the kids ready for a five-day camping trip where you had you didn't have all the conveniences that we have they probably loaded up a donkey with some food but slept on the ground, uh, had <laughs> the meagerest of supplies because there wasn't a lot of food stores on the way. And, and two, the Passover, everybody was coming. So as they migrated to Jerusalem, we can expect that all the roads and the routes uh, there began to get more and more crowded. So maybe the firewood wasn't as prevalent. Some areas you can imagine um, the people migrating into Jerusalem. So that was the time, but I, but I remember our own family vacation times and the excitement of the kids uh, probably getting ready you know and, and it was a big festival of course the, the feast of the Passover was to celebrate the Lord's deliverance of the Hebrews from Egypt and um, the the mighty things that he did to, to, to Pharaoh and the Egyptians um, that were evident that he is God and he is the real God and and finally enabling or um, um, convincing through these terrible plagues, Pharaoh to let him go. And of course, the, the most severe, <coughs> which they're all pretty severe if you think about them, but today's not a lesson on the plagues. Um, specifically, it's a focus on the, the angel of death, which came at midnight, and it struck everybody in the land of Egypt unless you had killed a lamb, uh, an unblemished male lamb, a year old, and, and took with a hospice brush, and you put on the doorframe uh, the blood of the lamb. And it's significant, too, this is all so significant. Today's lesson, they were going to, the, to Jerusalem to study the Passover. Um, it was done uh, probably about, uh, four, I'm gonna just, I don't know off the top of my head, but I'm going to say 1400 B.C. was about when um, I believe the Passover actually happened when the exodus of uh, Egypt. I'm not exactly clear on that, but I think. But anyway, so this was about 1400 years later. Uh, that they were still celebrating this, this uh, va great victory that God had done for them. Um, to, to, and so they, 
they went annually to Jerusalem to celebrate. And again, so, so here was actually the true sacrificial lamb, Jesus, um, and, and the analogy of what God had prepared for the Passover was the blood of the lamb was going to save uh, the firstborn in that particular family. But the analogies of, of course, the blood of the lamb when Jesus died for us on the cross saves us from our sins and eternal damnation. So there's a lot of irony there, and God had architect all that. So anyway, they were on their way to, uh, to celebrate the Feast of the Passover, and so they packed up the kids, loaded up the donkey, headed south down to Jerusalem. It's a five-day trip, and they get there, and it starts off with a, uh, with a meal of the unleavened bread. And of course, you know the story of that. They didn't have time to even pack up uh, and leaven their bread before leaving Egypt. It was such a fast and hasty departure that they, they ate unleavened bread and been bitter herbs and things, so on and so forth. Um, and, but that kind of kicks it off. There's a big meal the, the first night of the vacation, of the festival, and then there's seven days with family and fin, friends and visiting, or six, and then there's a big feast again at the end. But not so much a study on the feast of the Passover, but that's where the folks were going. <clears throat> so we're going to start reading Scripture and, uh, <clears throat> and get into our lesson. Verse 40 is, <clears throat> Pardon me. The boy grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and God's grace was on him. Every year his parents traveled to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom of the festival. After those days were over, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But his parents did not know it. Assuming that he was traveling in the party, they went a day's journey. They had begun looking for him among their relatives and friends, and when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all those who heard him were astounded at his understanding and his answers. So let's go back and look at that verse by verse, and starting with verse, verse 40. So again, we don't know a lot about Jesus' youth, doesn't give a, the scripture doesn't give us a whole lot of <clears throat> a, a lot of information. We know he had four brothers. We know he had a number of sisters. Um, so you can imagine uh, the, the household. And I've often wondered what were the sibling sibling, sibling rivalries like for Jesus. Um, you know the fights over the bathroom and various and sundry things. And was he right there in the middle, or was he always kind of the peacemaker to a certain degree? Or sometimes when he really needed to go, was he? Mom, my sister won't let me get in the bathroom, or that kind of thing. But, but nonetheless, it was a large household, had a lot of brothers and sisters, and I can imagine that, again, um, there was a lot of excitement uh, for the pilgrimage to Jerusalem with that family. But Scripture does tell us here in that gap that the boy grew and became strong. And it's important, and this lesson really focus on this, and I'd like the viewers to really, really focus on this as well and understand that, that, that without a shadow of a doubt, Jesus was a hundred percent human. He was a hundred percent God, but he was hundred percent human. That he experienced all the things that we experienced: hunger, pain. He grew. His body grew. His bones grew. His hair grew. He went through puberty. His his voice changed undoubtedly. Um, um, he grew from an adolescent to a youth to to a man. And so, um, Scripture is telling us that all these things were happening. And at about the age of 12, he probably began to fill out and get some muscle tone, become helpful around the house, various other things. And, and Scripture also tells us a couple of other things, which is really, really awesome, and that he was filled with wisdom, and God's grace was on him. And last week, we talked about uh, uh, God's glory. If you recall, or if you weren't with us, I, I just want to share briefly that I was at a missionary's, um, was, was giving a, a talk, and I, I went to that, and he had asked a question about what wanted us to write down the answer to what is God's purpose. And I won't go into a lot of detail, but I really struggle with that. And as I've shared last week, because God's purpose is infinite. I mean, he's in everything. He's everywhere. He's, he's um, omnipotent, and his purpose is, is many. And how do you, how do you even write that down? And <clears throat> so in Romans chapter 2, which we're going to talk a little about, Romans chapter 5, 
it, it, it talks about, let me just read that real quick for those who weren't maybe here last week, but <clears throat> just to get a, because get a, we're going to go back to that word grace, and that word grace is really, really important and a key focus word for today. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace, which we stand and we exalt in the hope and the glory of God. And so, so I want you guys to think about the glory of God. And so that, that the concordance on Romans chapter 5, and verse 2 in my Bible says, and God's purpose is his glory. And so if you, if you think about that, if you can envision him in all his might and all his, his glory and his, his brilliance that is the creator sitting on the throne, the architect of everything that knit it all together, the sciences, the, the astrologies, the world, human body, anatomy. He's the architect of all that and not, not did he just manufacture it, but he spoke it into being and so that guy in his glory that that even in, in the last chapter of revelations it talks about his glory lighting up heaven there's no lesser or greater lights it's him and his glory lights it up and and so that glory his grace i like to think of his grace is a byproduct of that glory and so so that grace and guys the beautiful thing about the grace that was upon Jesus Christ, we get that same thing too. And we don't earn it, and we don't have to work our way to get it. It's just by faith. And it doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done or who you are. And we're going to talk about that a little bit in the people that he was talking to. But you get it just by your faith. You're saved by his grace and your faith. And then that glory is manifested into his grace. So, I just, it's a really a powerful verse to me and something that I would just really, really like to focus on. And so I, I'm hopeful that you guys take some time and read Romans chapter 5. Again, it's all relevant now because it also talks about tribulation and how we exalt in that too. But really gets us a focus on God's, that purpose of God's, which is his glory. And then we are truly a benefactor of that through our faith. So, so and this same, and my point to it all is, in this scripture, we get to partake in the same grace that Jesus did when we walk in fellowship with God through Jesus Christ. So the boy grew strong. He was filled with wisdom and God's grace. And his wisdom is another thing that we can pray for and ask for. And guys, it's, it's all right here. And so um, discernment. Discernment is a great thing as believers for us to pray for and ask for. To be, to be filled with that wisdom as well. Understanding is critical, and, and you can't get it um, you know, without studying, without praying, without fellowship with others and learning. And so um, it, 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 that is why Sunday school and church is important and, and the fellowship with other believers and time together, so on and so forth. And I'm, I'm excited about this, this ministry. I'm excited about uh, the, the, the video ministry. But there's nothing like brothers and sisters getting together, studying his word. And I hope we can get back to that soon, as, as I think that, that is, a, is a further benefit to us to all be able to, to be together. But again, that's verse 40. God's grace was on him. And every year his parents traveled to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. Again, it's a five-day journey when he was 12 years old. And then again, this, this is time when you, when you further study uh, 12 years old is about the time that the, 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 the men and the family started to, to really study and learn, particularly about the history of their faith and their religion. And so it wasn't uncommon for um, Jesus to be with some folks that would talk to him and teach him more about Scripture and about their customs and that kind of thing. So <clears throat> they're on their way. They get down there and it, you know, we don't know where they stayed. You can imagine that Jerusalem was packed. Um, I would imagine that the, the, the full time wasn't spent with a temple. It was probably, there perhaps was family there they stayed with. You know, Scripture's silent on that. I don't, I don't really know. But obviously they stayed probably somewhere in the city. Assume it's with family, although don't, don't really know that. It could have been um, at a public place, you know, 
of some sort, an inn, as we know that they had in those particular days. But nonetheless, they were there probably for about a week. That's the custom of the festival. And as those days were over, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know us. Now, I, I find that humorous, um, you know, grew, growing up in the age of home alone, where the family leaves on a vacation and leaves a child back at home. And I know in my history, there, back in the late 1800s, my family was in Divine, and they went back to visit other family in Gonzales by horse and wagon, and they had a large family, uh, seven children, and they, they camped on the way up there, and rumor has it that they left the campsite and left a, uh, like three or four little girl there at the campsite, and luckily a cowboy came by and picked up the child and brought her to the, um, brought her to the traveling wagon before they got too far out of the way. But, so anyway, so it, it happens, and again, um, if, if you can imagine, if, if the town of Nazareth is, is coming down for this festival, it's a big thing, you know, in the town of Nazareth, don't know the size of that at that particular time, but I'm sure it was like a big community, like just a, a caravan of friends and family. So it maybe wasn't uncommon that he was with the Smiths or the Jones or whoever, and they had kids, and he had a buddy, and he was playing with them. And so um, you can see how perhaps it happened. Obviously, Scripture says that it happened, so nonetheless, um, they were... Uh, about a day's journey out, and they got looking for Jesus, and he was nowhere to be found. And you can imagine, um, again, at, at the age of 12, we can assume that he's already got other siblings, uh, brothers and sisters, again, don't know exactly how many at that particular time, but Mary's probably got her handful, keeping all the other kids in tow. And so at this point, they're probably pretty worried, and they turn around and go back to Jerusalem to see where their son Jesus is. <clears throat> Assuming he was traveling in the party, they went a day's journey. When they began to look for him among their relatives and friends, again, part of the caravan, um, when they did, they didn't find him. And so they went back to search for him in Jerusalem. So all the way back, they were going. You can imagine that they were pretty distraught, pretty worried about where this child Jesus was. They... Um, and it says after three days, so that, I wondered, I'm not really clear where after three days means after three days they got to Jerusalem or three days after they got, they recognized that they are, were, were missing him. And so anyway, nonetheless, say it was three days after they ris recognized him, that he was gone. It was a full day back to Jerusalem, so that's a day. They spent a day looking, and then they finally went to the temple and when they found him there, they, they found him sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And those who heard him were astounded at his understanding and his answers. So interesting things. All right, so let's, so let's think about it. This, this much we know. We know that there was three days between when his parents left, at least three days, when his parents left and when his parents found him again. So... You know, where was he staying? You know, what, what, a 12-year-old boy, uh, probably not able to completely take care of himself. Don't know how safe certain things were in that particular era. But um, nonetheless, probably, again, makes me think there was family there and, and maybe an uncle and aunt or whomever. And just going, yeah, that, you know, that, so not sure the conversation that was had there. But, but nonetheless, he probably had a place to stay and was staying and cared for. But every day went back to the temple. Now the irony of ironies here is who are these people that he's talking to? Who were the, uh, when it talks about him and all those that, that heard him and he was sitting among the teachers. So who do we believe that the teachers to be? Pardon me just a second. <clears throat> well, undoubtedly the teachers were the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, those people that you know, and again, we talked last week about the law, but, but those people were the, were, the, were the students, were the lecturers, were the professors who understood the law and studied the law and lived by the law. And, and the fallacy of it is they felt like they were saved by the law. We're going to talk about that just in a minute. And they were the ones who were there, and they were teaching, and they were listening. So not only was Jesus there absorbing 
what was being told about, about scriptures, you know, the Old Testament, Jeremiah and um, Isaiah and various other books that they read from in scripture and lessons that he talked about Moses and Abraham, various other things, I'm sure. But they were astounded by what they heard him say and his knowledge at just, as just a, young, a youngster. But the irony of ironies is these are the very people that scripture says were astounded with what he said today who 20 years later when Jesus comes and, and, and says basically the same message about, about who he is and about God, they reject him. And they were not willing to, uh, to accept his, 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 his words or his message and did everything in their power to try to squelch him and obviously thought they did with his crucifixion but it only fulfilled the prophecy and set him up as the redeemer and sacrificial lamb who died for our sins. So interesting, the irony there of, of, the, of the people that accepted him 20 years before um, he came back again in his ministry. <clears throat> so uh, there we, we, we finished through verse 47. Now we go on to verse 48. This is, this is an interesting aspect. And when his parents saw him... They were astonished, and his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have be, been anxiously searching for you. Now, I don't, I don't know about Joseph, but I, I, I can only imagine my response if that had been me and my, my parents. I, I think I would have earned a, a whipping at the very least just for putting my parents at so much fear. They would have been overjoyed that they found me, but my dad would have been furious that I hadn't complied with, because I'm sure his instructions would have been pretty clear cut. Hey, load up, we're moving out, you need to be with X, Y, Z, and we're headed back home, and you have altered our plans, and we were scared to death. But, um, but anyway, you can see that they were frantic, and I do, I do love the part, I, I so like to focus on Joseph again, and, and think about the kind of man that he was, that God chose him to be, the, the earthly father for Jesus. And here Mary says, your father, so not your stepfather or anything like that. It's he was his earthly father. And we can only imagine that he took him and loved him like he did his own son and raised him up um, uh, with, with the things that he know, needed to know about being a man. And obviously he followed in the trade of his father and was a carpenter. <clears throat> but your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. And so Jesus says, says this, why were you searching for me? And he, he asked him, didn't you know that it was necessary for me to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. And here's, here's the other part of the lesson, folks, that we need to think about and understand as we look at Jesus' life and we use that as a mentor for how we need to live our life you know, in our desire to be Christ-like is, is two things. He talks about his father's house. And again, the value, you know, when the Hebrews were in the desert after leaving Egypt, it was essential. They wanted to build a temple and to worship God in a place where the spirit of God was. And so they built a tent type temple. And then later when they came into the promised land, they wanted to build the temple and David had a desire to do it, but his son Solomon built this, this, this tremendous temple which they could worship God. And so the temple is, is, and it's talking about here with his father's house, was a very important place. And so I, I, will, I will stress I was, I was not in favor of closing the churches with this coronavirus because just because of that, because I've I felt like this is, if there's ever a time where people need to be together to, you know, they might have questions or this is a place when times are hard to come and pray and, 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 and worship. And so I struggle with that a little bit. But again, you know, the church isn't necessarily the building. It's the body of believers. And it's, it's where, you know, ever two or more are gathered in his name, he has promised that his spirit is there also. So, um, it's, it's not essential that you have a building in order to meet, and we know that's the case, but it is, it is important and it is, it is nice 
to have a place to go where you can worship. And so the temple is, is synonymous with worship and it's synonymous with reverence and synonymous with thinking about God and all His power and all His majesty and all His glory sitting on His throne. And, and guys, the things that He has done for us, um, you know, f- first and foremost, salvation, redemption, forgiveness of sin, um, that, and, and, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tie this in a little bit, again, talking about the Sadducees and the Pharisees and about, uh, uh, about the law and what was so frustrating to the Sadducees and Pharisees about Jesus is he was just this carpenter's son from Nazareth. And who was he to have this following and have this power and have this authority and have this wisdom when he didn't go to school like they didn't, he didn't have the knowledge and he wasn't part of the club, you know, to be a Sadducee and Pharisees because they, they focused their whole life on living by the law, you know, and so they thought the law saved them. Now, it was important, we talked about this last week, that Jesus was born under the law. He was born according to the laws and, and you know, they dedicated him and they circumcised him as what was the law and they followed that protocol but he came to make all things new. And when he died, when, he, when his blood was shed for us on the cross and covered our sins like the Passover, like the, the blood over the door of the Hebrews in Egypt, um, that, that you know, made us free from the law, not free from following the law, but, but the law is not the way to heaven. And so if, if you evaluate the two and look at it, you get to heaven by following the law, well, then that means you get to heaven by your own good works. And that's not it. You're saved by your faith and God's grace, not by your works. Although works is evident of a, of a Christian, the fruits of the Spirit and so on and so forth. It's not the law that saves you. It's your faith that saves you. And so that was what was so hard for these, for these Sadducees and Pharisees is that they were under the law and they were living by their law and their whole life was the law and they followed it to the key, the T. And they, they believed that was the way and Jesus was talking a new way and they, they, they couldn't understand it and they felt threatened and so therefore they wanted to squelch this problem and move on as what they've always known. And so, so anyway, off track a little bit there, but it is relative that, that we understand and think about the, the people that were there in the temple, and 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 then what the relevance of what Jesus was was talking and going to portray some years later, but but again back to Jesus and his the dialogue between his mother and his father, that in addition to him being in the temple, the house of his heavenly Father, and where he worshipped and where it was going to be the basis of his mission on earth, um, it was. He was being, the other thing that's, that's important is he was being obedient. He was, he, was, he was learning more. He was gaining knowledge. He was doing those things that were important um, in order for him to fulfill his task that God had assigned to him to do. And so another thing that we can glean from Jesus at this young age was his obedience, his obedience to God and even we know he carried that out to a tremendous level to even death on the cross and all the other things, not to mention when he started his ministry and was tempted, uh, but his obedience to the word of God enabled him to stand above the temptation that was presented to him by Satan. And so it, that's another thing, too, for us to want to, to try to emulate from Christ is just obedience, obedience in him and obedience in reading, obedience in praying, obedience in fellowship. One of my, I know there was a time in my life where I was, I was just really struggling with some internal turmoil and I was reading scripture one night and came across uh, 1 Thessalonians, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 18 and following. I'm going to read it for you here if I can get my hand on it real quick and it, it, it it's relative to obedience in the things that we're supposed to do but as sometimes hopefully you guys have experienced too is is uh, man I just I just 
this, this turmoil was just always present, you know, and always thinking about it and always struggling with it. And I, re- I read these verses, and it just, I felt my shoulders relax, and I felt peace, and I felt calm. And that's what happens when the Spirit comes to you and when, when, you're, when you're walking in harmony with God. But these verses is what spoke so deeply to me, and it, it talks about, again, being obedient in the things that we're supposed to do. Verse 16 says, Rejoice always. And that's it. Rejoice always. Verse 17 says, Pray without ceasing. So first and foremost, those are pretty easy verses for me to remember. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Pretty simple. And the 18th verse says, In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So, again, as we seek to be obedient, um, first and foremost, Rejoice always. And so, uh, you know, I, I like to think about Daniel when he was told not to pray to anybody but to the king of, um, to, this, to the uh, king, the, the Persian king. He couldn't acknowledge or worship anybody but him or else be thrown in the lion's den. And he was well into his 80s by that time. Scripture tells us, I believe it's in Daniel chapter 7, I think verse 10, that he went home, faced Jerusalem, and he prayed and gave thanks. And so the, the focal point is what did he have to be thankful for? He was a captive his whole life. Um, he was taken as a teenager, as a young man, um, probably never got to fulfill his life dreams, but yet he served God and his kingdom with his whole life. And Scripture says he prayed and gave thanks. So it's important that we understand that, that, that we're thankful. And, and so if a guy like Daniel can be thankful uh, even amongst difficult circumstances. Um, it's important that we understand and think about this in our obedience is rejoice always. There's, there's always things to be happy, be thankful for. Folks, I, I know right now, you know, my wife, I, just, I, I can see the stress in her. I, I know everybody's stressed to the max over this, um, this virus and, and our solutions to it um, history will tell if they're right or they're wrong and I'm not going to Monday morning quarterback that but um, but it, it's a stressful time and so what reasons do we have to rejoice well you know, look look at all the family time that people are having um, I know of multiple families that are you know kids in their 20s and 30s that are coming back home and spending some time with mom and dad and and parents are spending some time and and you know there there's there's always good that happens, um, even even in difficult times, and so um, it can it can always be worse. We can always focus on that, but pray without ceasing. Is another, and I'm just talking about obedience, and we're we're tying that to Christ's obedience to to following God's will to learn more about Him to prepare Him for His mission. So, pray without ceasing. And so, what does that mean? Well, that's what that means. Pray without ceasing. Pray. You know, sometimes I feel, you know, I, I feel bad because sometimes, you know, when I'm praying to myself, I'll, I'll say a prayer and I'll get sidetracked and think about something else and get completely off topic. Of, and then I'll think, oh, Lord, forgive me. I, I was praying and I started thinking about hunting or something else and I just completely lost my train of mind. And I know some people set their watches to ring to remind them to pray or set their cell phones to ring and remind them to pray. It's terrible that we have to do that, but... But it's important. And folks, this, this, I'm convinced that if we really knew this side of heaven, the power in our prayers, we would pray without ceasing. And if there's anything that's going to bring unity back in this country that's going to take us to a solution quicker, folks, it's prayer. And there's probably people out there that don't agree or don't concur with that. But I, I, I believe to the core of my foundation that, that prayer changes things and prayer makes a difference. And so I just, I just admonish and request that you guys pray for our country and pray often, um, as Scripture tells us. And then, again, going as re- rejoice always, so that's exactly what that means. But then the last verse in this, this trilogy of verses that I really like, in everything gives thanks. And so what is that? What is everything? What is everything? Well, everything is everything. And everything means things that are even difficult. And that's what's good about Romans chapter 5 and talks about 
exalt even in tribulation because tribulation brings perseverance and perseverance brings proven character and proven character brings hope and in hope we can exalt in our Lord Jesus Christ through him and so so for the for the believer even tribulation is is reason for us to be thankful because it builds our character and it it it, it increases our hope so on and so forth so all that again is a sidebar of looking at the obedience of Christ and trying to emulate that in our life. And we need, we need to be obedient to Him and we need to be obedient in our worship of Him. And, and again, I can't, I can't say without, without throwing this out there, what, what an amazing God that, that created us to worship. And guys, either, either we're, we're, we're going to be a worshiper of Him or we're not. It's just like... Um, Either, you know, as we talk about the Old Testament, you know, either you were a Gentile or you're a Jew, you're one or the other. Well, either you're on God's team or you're not on God's team. And if either you're going to worship God or you're going to worship something else. And so um, we were made to worship. And so you need to check yourself and see what is it that you worship? Where is it that you put your trust? Where is it that you put your faith? Where is it that you put your hope, you know? Those are the things that you worship, and so you need to check that and make sure that your focus is correct on worshiping God. But, um, <clears throat> but anyway, as we, as we walk through this and, and, and think again about, about Jesus and his, uh, his desire to be in his Father's house, worshiping him and being obedient, um, that is an essential aspect of today's lesson and understanding the importance of, of this worship and making sure that we're on the right side of, uh, of that. But again, talking about God and about his creating us to worship in, in, his, um, in his incredible wisdom, he gave us free will. You know, he, he could have said to us or could have mandated that, that man worship him um, and made us to worship and worship, we just automatically worship him. But he gave us the free will to choose in, to worship him. And so my prayer, my request, is that is the choice that you in the audience make to choose to worship him. Um, because mandated love is really not love. It, it, love, when it comes from your heart, is true love, and that's what God seeks. All right, moving on to the third section. <clears throat> and when he went down... Then he, this is verse 51. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother kept all these things in her heart, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, in favor with God and with people. And so, again, remember the temple was built on kind of on a hill, and so they came down out of the temple and then went back to Nazareth, which was going back north, and it was he was obedient to them, and so. We, you know, you could say, well, he wasn't very obedient because obviously his parents said, all right, load up. It's time to go back to Nazareth three days before. And he felt the, the need to be obedient to his heavenly father. But it's, it's important that we know, too, that, that he was obedient to his parents. Obviously, he began at some point to realize that, that he had a mission from God. You know, at, at what being fully human, at what point? Did, did the child really know that he was Jesus? And that's a deep question. Maybe as soon as he became, um, I don't know, an adolescent or whatever. But, but he, again, set the example in Scripture, says that he was because he was obedient to him is what it's told in Luke. And remember, as we talked about last week, Luke had a lot of interaction. Of course, he went on a lot of the missionary journeys with Paul and had undoubtedly many opportunities to interview Mary. And it said when he wrote Luke, which was 60 A.D., um, uh, he, had, uh, he had spent a lot of time and, and, and actually was present during the, you know, the time right after the crucifixion and, the, and the, the ascension of Christ where Mary was present. So when Scripture says, and Mary pondered and kept these things in her heart, it's probably he had, he had firsthand knowledge of Mary telling her these stories and these, these things that she had witnessed. And so 
he was able to record those that you get the feeling and the insight from Mary's really um, 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 perspective on things. But, but, it, but it says, too, um, too, as we talked about in the last, the last section, she heard Jesus' excuse, but she really didn't understand it, um, what, what he was talking about in his father's house and so on and so forth. And we know that, too, um, fast forward to the Last Supper, that Jesus was, and Jesus had told his disciples all the time the same thing, that it's important that I go away, that I be crucified and, and that I die. And they were struggling to understand what that meant, even though from this perspective on this side of the cross, we can see what he meant by those statements. And likewise, they were able to put two and two together as, as they witnessed him resurrected and then being taken back up into heaven. But, but anyway, the, the important part, too, is he being obedient to his parents. I like to tie that to the fifth commandment because, you know, why is it important that we honor our mothers and fathers? And it, it is important particularly because if we, if, you know, the, the whole structure starts at home. And if you don't have a, uh, you know, a fatherly figure or if your father doesn't create an environment that, that is one that, you know, you grow in strong and in faith and, and, and nurture and so on and so forth, it can be hard to accept, you know, a fatherly figure like in heaven. And, and likewise, it, as a child, it's essential that you honor your parents um, and, and, and give them their proper place of authority through your obedience um, in, in, in order for you to accept, again, uh, a godly father. And so Jesus, again, sets the example by his obedience to them and um, uh, in, in minding them and being subservient to them through his life living with them in, in their home. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature. So again, as a young lad of 12, he continued to grow in wisdom. He continued to grow in stature and in favor with God and people. And so we know, too, that that, that happened, that he moved in the hearts of many, many, many people. But there was also some that, that were very adamantly against him. And so, but, but those were the choices that those particular people made. <clears throat> so anyway, that finishes up Luke chapter 2, and um, looking forward to next week, and we will probably be doing this again um, for the class next week, but hopefully um, in a week or two, and specifically by Easter, we'll be ready to uh, meet again. And some of you folks that uh, are maybe viewing online or through the internet, uh, hopefully, maybe you can come join us. Love to have you in our class and um, uh, sit down and study the scriptures together. Well, as is our custom, I think it's about time um, we try to get out in about 45 minutes or so. Um, we close with a prayer, and I usually ask some folks in the class to pray, but being that it's just me and that camera, I'll close in prayer. And my, my prayer is also for you and for your safety, for your health, and um, for your uh, obedience to the scripture and your worship to the God of glory. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God in heaven, thank you for this day and this opportunity to uh, spend time together studying your word. And Father God, we just praise you and we worship you and we, we exalt you on the throne and we, we, uh, we, uh, we are your people. We ask that you uh, forgive us where we fail you, that uh, you guide us and direct us in the things that we think, say, and do. And Lord, again, we ask your hand be upon this country. We pray for our president, vice president, and staff. We pray, Lord, for healing. We pray, Lord, for unity. We pray for um, the two sides to come together, Father, that... Uh, that they'll, they'll seek a solution with their heart first and a desire to keep America united and strong and free. And Father God, we pray for these, again, for these hospital workers and those that are, uh, that are working so diligently to keep us healthy and safe and alive. 
Lord God, we pray for them, and um, we pray for those that are that are assisting the effort with uh, additional hospital rooms and 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 these masks and ventilators and the things that are so necessary uh, to beat this disease. Lord God, we uh, we pray for your your churches across this country. We pray for the Christians of this land that we uh, continue to seek your face and to pray and to turn from our wicked ways and to humbly come before you, Lord. And um, we ask these things in Jesus Christ, your son's holy and precious name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.